Well, everybody, Professor Barth here, Associate Professor of History at Arizona State University. Welcome to part two of our series on John Locke, or a section on John Locke, which is part of a larger series, Foundations of Western Political Thought. For this video, we are going to look at the history, the historical context behind John Locke's thinking from the Stuart Restoration, the restoration of the crown in 1660, all the way up through the glorious revolution of 1688. And we'll, we'll take a look at these events through the perspective of John Locke. This is not an exhaustive survey, but is uh, primarily a, a very brief overview to give you, give you a, a bit of a, a, a window into the world of John Locke. If you haven't seen part one, the introduction, you ought to do so. Click on the link above. Obviously, John Locke, one of the greatest thinkers in the Western canon. He was born in 1632 in the southwest of England near Bristol, and he was just a youth when the English Civil War broke out in 1642. His father was actually a captain in the cavalry for the parliamentarians during the early part of the war. Locke enrolled at the Westminster School of London and studied Greek and Hebrew and mathematics. And then he was 16 years old when the king was beheaded publicly in London. And then throughout this interregnum period, as it is called, where there was no king, there was no House of Lords, no established Church of England, where the two sons of the beheaded king, Charles, the eldest son, and James, the younger son, were living in exile in France and in various points in time in the Spanish Netherlands, Locke was studying chemistry, medicine at Christ Church, which is the most prestigious college at the University of Oxford. He actually studied under Robert Boyle, the father of modern chemistry. Well, Cromwell, who was the Lord Protector, the head of the army during the Civil War and during the Interregnum period, died in 1658. And when he died, that left this enormous vacuum. There was a split within the army. His son, Richard, attempted to fill his shoes, didn't work out well. There was a real fear of anarchy, disorder in England. And all of a sudden, people said, you know what? Maybe we ought to reconsider this whole uh, small r Republican idea. Maybe, just maybe, a monarchy is the way to go. And conveniently, the two sons of King Charles I are living across the English Channel. Parliament invited Charles, who is uh, currently in again in France and the Spanish Netherlands, invited him to return to England. Charles, in return, declared his own political moderation. He declared that he would uh, give out a quote free and general pardon to those who had sided with Parliament during the Civil War, with two exceptions. The first exception for those who still refused to acknowledge his legitimacy as king, you had to obviously uh, swear an oath of allegiance to the king. But then number two, the other exception, if you took a leading role in the execution of his father, uh, that's a bridge too far. Everyone else a free and general pardon, and then he also promised religious toleration, and he promised to work with parliament. And so... In the spring of 1660, Charles departed from the Netherlands, and here his his grand departure, arriving in, uh, going across the Channel, and his arrival in England. He actually arrived on his 30th birthday in May of 1660. There he is, and the crown is now restored. The House of Lords was restored. 
The Church of England was restored. And this is not a figurehead monarchy. Now, it has there are some limitations. Charles is a Charles II is a more limited monarchy than what his father had been prior to the Civil War. But this is no figurehead. This is, you know, this is a a powerful and robust monarchy. Charles had the liberty to appoint any minister of state whom he wanted, any cabinet member, whomever. That was his royal prerogative. He also could dissolve parliament at will. Didn't like what was going on with parliament? Dissolve it. And he, he does that on a number of occasions. He could veto acts, or veto bills rather, passed by both chambers of parliament. And he could also, if he wanted, rule without parliament so long as he had the requisite funds and finances to do so. Now, the way the system was set up, it was very difficult to have the money available for the king to rule without parliament, but in theory, he could do that. And in fact, he, uh, the final four years of his reign, he ruled without any parliament at all. So again, this is a, a slightly more limited monarchy than the one prior to the Civil War. However, it is, uh, it's not absolute, but it is a, a meaningfully powerful monarchy. Nevertheless, and here is his, uh, I believe this was on his coronation day. Nevertheless, the memory and the, the legacy of the Civil War and then the Interregnum period, which was a decade in length. That's, you know, that's, that's not a short length of time. That's quite a substantial block of time. That memory and legacy never quite went away. You weren't really supposed to talk about it. Uh, it you know, the official narrative was that it was a disaster and a mistake and all the rest. But, but the uh, mystique of the crown had taken a major, major blow in those years. And you can't quite recover that fully in the aftermath, even with the restoration. Locke... <clears throat> was in his late 20s when the crown was restored. He, in the 1660s, became a member of the Royal Society, which was the, the leading scientific organization in England. He had received his Bachelor of Medicine from Oxford. But in 1666, when Locke was 32 years old, he was introduced to a man who would just play a pivotal role in his development and that that was lord anthony ashley cooper or we could say ashley for short ashley's father and grandfather served in parliament and his father actually had been created a baronet and so ashley sat in the house of lords ashley was deeply impressed with locke upon their first meeting locke was actually his personal physician of course, again, Locke had a background in medicine, a bachelor's degree in medicine. But very quickly, the two uh, realized that they had a whole lot in common politically. They had very similar political views. And Ashley, for example, appointed Locke to be uh, his personal secretary and the secretary for the a colony in the New World in America called Carolina, named after the current king, King Charles. Carolina was a proprietor colony. You had eight proprietors who had a, a stake in the colony. They needed a new constitution. And so in 1669, Ashley appointed Locke to draft this constitution for the new Carolina colony. And in it, it guaranteed religious freedom for everyone but atheists. It arranged for free men who had at least 50 acres of land who had the right to vote, so fairly liberal suffrage. There were some uh, illiberal parts of the Constitution as well. It, was, it had some neo-feudal aspects, including a system of hereditary serfdom and titles of nobility. And there's some debate about the extent to which Locke actually thought up, up all these ideas himself, himself, or whether, you know, maybe he was just a, a mere secretary. Nevertheless, Ashley and Locke grew very close. And then in 1672, Ashley was raised to the peerage. He was uh, created the 
first Earl of Shaftesbury. And from that point forward, he was known simply as Shaftesbury. And once he was raised to the peerage, again, sitting in the House of Lords, Shaftesbury quite quickly became the leading opposition leader in Parliament against those who wanted a powerful monarchy and became a leading proponent of those who wanted a more limited constitutional monarchy. Shaftesbury was the leading figure in these early days of a political faction in Parliament known as the Country Party. And the Country Party, again, supported a, a they weren't Republicans, meaning they, they weren't anti-monarch. However, they wanted a constitutional monarchy. They wanted some limitations placed on a monarchy, and they wanted a, a central role for parliament. And the country party was also stood in opposition to the court party. The court party, we could maybe call the establishment today, the ministers of state who have been appointed by Charles, who really supported, um, again, a, a powerful monarch bordering on absolute monarchy. Um, a, a monarch who ruled by divine right, which was still a popular theory during this day. The court party supported these ideas of divine right of kings. The court party, which later became known as the Tory party, argued that there is no right to resistance against a king, that the king is actually subject to God alone. The king is not subject to or accountable to any other earthly authority, including parliament. The king is above parliament, subject only to God. And in theory, well, that relation to God will cause the king to rule according to laws of, of justice and but and equity. But uh, this whole uh, system, this whole ideology that emerged from the, the Tory party tended to emphasize emphasize hierarchy, order, authority. The opposition, led by Shaftesbury and increasingly John Locke, wanted to say, no, uh, the, the king does not have absolute authority. Rather, uh, parliament is at least of equal importance and the monarchy must be limited. This country party eventually became known as the Whig party. The Whig and Tory labels were initially epithets, but they were eventually became embraced by both parties. So you have the origin of the political party system, the Whig party represented by Shaftesbury and the Tory party represented by those who supported divine right. Well, as Shaftesbury emerged as this leader of the country party, leader of the Whigs, he quickly fell out of favor of King Charles II. Uh, King Charles's ministers did not like Shaftesbury, and Shaftesbury did not like them. Now, again, Shaftesbury went to great lengths to to uh, assure the public and the king that he was completely loyal to the king. He was he was a monarchist. However, of course, Charles did not like this development of this this new faction in in politics. Charles was becoming increasingly impatient with Parliament and increasingly drawn to an alternative example of monarchy across the channel, and that was in France, represented by King Louis XIV, also known as the Sun King. King Louis XIV was an absolute monarch. He did not have to rule with a parliament. In fact, there was not a single parliament or anything remotely resembling it called during his entire uh, uh, multi decade reign from 1661 onward he was actually just i think five years old when he became king but once he was an adult he ruled as an absolute monarch he had advisors but it was ultimately up to him and he became the most powerful monarch in all of europe bar none he had the largest army even his navy was beginning to rival that of england's of course the Palace of Versailles, and if you've never been to Versailles and you have a chance to go to France, I highly recommend it. It's, it's amazing, absolutely incredible. That was built during Louis XIV's 
rain, there's the Hall of Mirrors. There's the French court, King Louis standing at the front. Uh, obviously, there was a lot of bribery and corruption in France at the time, but it was actually a remarkably effective central administration. King Louis XIV famously said, quote, l'état c'est moi. Literally translated, the state, it is me. Or we could rephrase it, I am the state. I am the state. This was the absolutist model, and it seemed to be working pretty well in the late 17th century. Now, during the 1650s, Charles, a younger Charles, and his younger brother, James, lived for a period in France and actually got to know Louis. And in fact, King Louis XIV was their cousin. Okay, so they're cousins with King Louis XIV. And during that time, Charles and James both became quite enamored with this French system. And as France increased in power, as Louis became known as this just amazing model for absolute monarchy in Europe, Charles and his younger brother, who's not yet king, are looking across the channel and saying, gee, <laughs> uh, that sounds pretty good. But, you know, here you got Louis, but in England, King Charles is having to deal with guys like Shaftesbury and, and the Whigs. It's very inconvenient. It's not, it's not efficient. It's not an efficient mode of government according to the, the conventions of the day. So things are beginning to trend toward an absolutist model. Locke perceived this and in 1675 voluntarily exiled himself to France of all places, but um, not as a, uh, well, he, well, uh, exiled to France and then lived in France for almost four years. Now, while he was there in France, you know, he wasn't writing political, political tracts or speaking out against the French king, obviously. He actually worked as a tutor and as a physician. However, he made this decision to live in France for a while because things didn't look so hot. He started to worry. Could, as, as, a, as someone who has played a leading role in the country party, the Whigs, could I potentially be arrested? Shaftesbury stayed behind in England. He did not ex self-exile in the mid-1670s, and he paid a price. In 1677, he was arrested and imprisoned in the Tower of London, released the following year but that experience really was a uh, really highlighted wow things are starting to unravel here in england are we in england moving toward this absolutist model it was a real question in the late 1670s and and into the 1680s he was released in 1678 Locke returned to england in 1679 to, to join up again with shaftesbury and once Shaftesbury was released from the Tower of London, you would think, oh, maybe he's learned his lesson. He's going to keep quiet now. He's going to be a very obedient earl in the House of Lords. Not the case. Shaftesbury spearheaded in a parliament in 1679 a habeas corpus act. Now, habeas corpus is, is the principle that you cannot be imprisoned indefinitely, that, the, that there has to be a reason uh, it, it, it has to that that the courts actually have a duty, are bound by law, to examine whether or not your detention is lawful. Now, habeas corpus was was protected, in theory, under Magna Carta. However, uh, it's beginning to be subverted, and was subverted also during the reign of King Charles I. And so Shaftesbury argued we need this codified in law. He got that act passed in 1679. Actually, the Habeas Corpus Act is considered part of the English Constitution. But Shaftesbury and other Whigs feared that King Charles might retaliate against their political, against his political opposition by imprisoning them indefinitely. So let's get this into law. But there was something else that Shaftesbury had his eye on, and that was the future King of England. 
the younger brother of Charles, James, Duke of York. Now, what was wrong with James? Well, James, it came out a few years earlier, had converted to, Ro uh, to Roman Catholicism. And at the time, it was a very popular belief, not unfounded, among the Whigs that Roman Catholicism had an, in an innate propensity toward absolute monarchy, toward hierarchical forms of civil government. That if you get a Catholic king, on, again, on the throne of England, there might be religious persecution against tolerance, uh, against Protestants, and there might be a, a push toward a French model of monarchy. This kicked off, well, <laughs> and the other reason why this wasn't unfounded, James himself was very public of his admiration for his cousin, King uh, Louis XIV. And that's in 1680, a book by Sir Robert Filmer, who had actually passed away a few decades earlier, but the book had never been published, um, a book called Patriarcha or The Natural Power of Kings was published in 1680. And in his book, Filmer argues very fervently, adamantly, for divine right of kings. And King James II was a divine, or excuse me, James at this time, was the Duke of York, was a, a fervent uh, divine right man, divine right of kings. He belonged to that whole theory. James married a woman from Italy who was also a Roman Catholic. And so this prospect of, okay, what happens when Charles dies? Charles is eventually going to die. James is next in line for the throne. He has a Roman Catholic wife. He, he's Roman Catholic himself. He, he deeply admires King Louis XIV. We need to exclude him from the throne. That was Shaftesbury's thinking. It was Locke's thinking. It was the Wake Party's position. And in 1679 to 1681, a crisis erupted called the Exclusion Crisis in Parliament. Three parliaments in a row attempted to pass a law that would officially prohibit Roman Catholics from the throne in England. And everyone knew what the intent was to keep the Duke of York, James Duke of York, from the throne. Now, a few years before this, in 1673, Parliament had passed a law called the Test Act, which prohibited Roman Catholics from being in Parliament. So Roman Catholics are already barred from sitting in Parliament during this period. However, they're not barred from the monarchy. And so this was a, a final attempt to prohibit James from becoming king. Failed. Failed. Charles, again, the king had a the prerogative of dissolving parliament at will. Charles dissolved each of the parliaments before the bills could pass. So he had three exclusion bills back to back to back. Charles dissolving the parliaments. Um, Shaftesbury, again, spearheaded the exclusion bills. Locke was a strong supporter of the exclusion bills as well. When the final exclusion parliament, it was called the Oxford Parliament, was dissolved in 1681, Charles said, you know what, enough is enough. I'm not going to rule with any parliament for the remainder of my reign. And from 1681 until Charles's death in 1685, he did not summon a single parliament, no parliament whatsoever. How did he have the money to do it? Well, his cousin, King Louis XIV, gave him the money, gave him the funds that he needed. It was actually done in secret. It was a secret subsidy from the French king to the English king in order to uh, prevent him from needing to summon a parliament. Think, so think about that. The king of France is giving a monetary subsidy, a pay payments to the king of England so that he doesn't have to call a new parliament. Pretty wild, pretty wild. Shaftesbury in 1681 was arrested for high treason. Thankfully for Shaftesbury, they had a uh, 
they had just recent the parliament had just recently passed the habeas corpus act and so had to be brought before a court and he was acquitted by a london jury the the evidence that was brought against him was just too weak now in reality shaftesbury actually was conspiring with various figures in the underground about what to do once charles died there was no uh, not an assassination plot per se against charles but arranging for okay when charles dies let's move to prevent james duke of york from becoming king shaftesbury was involved in some of that and so after he was acquitted by the london jury he fled to holland this was in i think uh, november of 1682 but regrettably died two months later in January of 1683. So that's the end of Shaftesbury. Locke, for his part, saw the writing on the wall and he's like, I'm out of here. And fled to Holland in September of 1683. And it's a good thing because uh, uh, you, you never know what could have happened with Locke. For example, there was one very prominent Whig named Algernon Sidney. Algernon Sidney was a, an old English Republican who had served in Parliament during the English Civil War and during the Interregnum. He had never reconciled himself with monarchy. He, during this time, was writing secretly a book, a very radical book, called Discourses Concerning Government. And in this book, it was, he was very critical of monarchy as an institution. He openly supported the right of the people to abolish a tyrannical government. He didn't dare publish this during his lifetime. You, in fact, actually, the, the law was such that if you, uh, you could not, it was illegal to publish any work without the state's permission. But it was discovered what he was doing. Sidney was also involved in a conspiratorial plot to assassinate the king supposedly there's debate about the extent to which he was involved in that it's called the rye house plot he was arrested for treason for plotting to assassinate charles and james he was put on trial and executed in december of 1683 now the founding fathers were deeply deeply influenced by algernon sydney this work discourses concerning government is absolutely just excellent. I'm going to make a, a single video on Algernon Sydney after we're done with Locke. We'll, we'll do the videos on Locke and then I'll make one final video on Sydney because actually the founding fathers were arguably just as influenced, if not more influenced by Sydney as Locke. Sydney was rightly so considered a martyr for liberty. He's a bit of a forgotten figure since then, but Sydney is very, very important. So Locke, Locke's like, I'm out of here. Get me out. And uh, he lived in Holland for the next five and a half years. Again, Charles ruled without a parliament through this period. Charles died in February of 1685, and now a new king on the throne. Now, there was an attempt, uh, an attempted rebellion when, after Charles died, it was called Monmouth's Rebellion, failed, suppressed. And so now we have a new king james and boy uh he gets started off with a bang he had to call a parliament in the beginning it was a very loyal parliament but over the next subsequent months it became a little uh, uh too uh incompliant for james's liking so he dissolved it in november of 1685 and then for the rest of his brief reign he ruled alone without any parliament and during that time he arbitrarily suspended habeas corpus he actually erected a a spy network in england that went to uh like coffee houses and taverns to to see what the Whigs were saying he continued to receive subsidies from the french monarch that would fund his government so he wouldn't have to call a parliament he violated the law which barred Catholics from being commissioned into the army. That was part of the Test Act in 1673. He just ignored it and commissioned Catholics to be officers in the army. And actually he built up a standing army. During time of peace, England was not at war. And yet King James II increased the size of the army from 10,000 men to 40,000 men. Quite a large standing army during time of peace. And so uh, Whigs were just 
completely alarmed during this period, and even some moderate Tories became increasingly alarmed. Locke, again, is in Holland during the entirety of James's reign. There's uh, James's wife, Mary, and in June of 1688, birth of a son, James Francis Edward Stuart. And it was really the birth of his son in June of 1688 that it really sunk in. Wow, we may have a perpetual Roman Catholic absolutist monarchy in England if something doesn't happen quickly. And things did happen quickly. English dissidents, mostly Whigs, like Whig uh, merchants and even some moderate Tories, secretly wrote the Stadtholder of the Netherlands, and the Stadtholder was essentially the executive power in the Netherlands. It was like a, a military governor of sorts. William of Orange wrote William, and in so many words invited him to invade England. Now, why William of Orange? Well, again, William of Orange was the executive power in the Netherlands. William was a Protestant. He was actually a Calvinist. So that checked off that box. And William was also, as it so happens, wedded to the eldest daughter of King James II, Mary. <laughs> so uh, stated differently, William was King James II's son-in-law. So that was convenient as well for those who wanted to work out uh, some sort of plan to get James out of power. Well, on the 5th of, of November, 1688, William invaded England with a Dutch army of 20,000 men. It, this is a foreign army, 20,000 Dutchmen. They had to be, obviously, uh, there was no way by land, and so they had to cross the channel, crossed it in over 400 transport vessels. So this, it was this huge undertaking. It actually received financial backing from Whig merchants in London, as well as from the Dutch government. James, once he heard about the arrival of this foreign invader, uh, tried to rally the army to defend his kingdom, but the army stood down. The army stood down, deserted him. And so James, in desperation, uh, hightailed it across the channel to France, fled to France, where he lived in exile until his death in 1702. So that was the end of James. Lived out uh, 13 more years in exile. The fact that James fled across the English Channel was seen as an abdication of the throne. And so since the king had abdicated, William and Mary were declared king and queen of England, and they were actually declared joint sovereigns. And as part of the agreement, they, agree, they agreed to a constitutional limited monarchy. It, even this was not a pure figurehead position at this point. They still had some powers of, uh, of appointing ministers of state, for example, but it was a, a more limited constitutional monarchy for sure. Why at joint sovereigns? Well, you had William III, and William III will, will reign for 13 years. Um, but Mary was also declared the sovereign uh, to give some legitimacy to it. She was part of the Stuart family. She was the daughter of the former king, James II. And so there was some concern that this could be seen as, a, as an illicit, illegitimate coup. And in order to guard against those feelings, well, let's declare Mary to be queen. She dies in 1694 and, and William is the sole sovereign from 1694 until his death in 1702. Locke returned to England in February of 1689, shortly after the revolution. By the way, it's called the Glorious Revolution because there was uh, very little, if any, bloodshed. Sometimes you'll hear it referred to as the Revolution of 1688. 
a fairly clean break from the from James II now to William and Mary. The College of William and Mary, by the way, is named after these two monarchs. It was the College of William and Mary was founded in Virginia in 1692, I believe. And as part of this new regime, Parliament drafted and passed a Bill of Rights. And this is the original Bill of Rights. And our own Bill of Rights in the United States, if you're an American citizen, I suppose I probably have quite a few non-Americans who also watch these videos, but if you're an American citizen, our own Bill of Rights are modeled closely after these. And this Bill of Rights uh, includes uh, all sorts of um, liberties, primarily for Parliament. Regular Parliaments were guaranteed. It, it put into code that the, the monarch's power was indeed limited. But then we have some familiar things from an, the American vantage point. Prohibition against cruel and unusual punishment. That language comes from the English Bill of Rights. It's included in, a, in our Eighth Amendment. Right to bear arms is in the English Bill of Rights. Our Second Amendment. Why the right to bear arms? Well, James had had a uh, built up a standing army and had also tried to limit the power of the of the people, of the citizenry, to bear arms in order to counter that state force. And so this right to bear arms, the whole idea of it was not for hunting or whatever. No, it was actually seen as a bulwark against tyrannical government. That's why the right to bear arms is indeed such an important and critical liberty. Sadly, the English people today do not, uh, the English people today no longer enjoy that central right. And it also guaranteed freedom of speech in Parliament. Now, our First Amendment is applied for all citizens. Uh, here, this protected speech in Parliament, but that itself was a, a major, was major progress. Locke actually helped to draft much of the English Bill of Rights. So we can include the English Bill of Rights as part of Locke's canon. It didn't go as far as he had hoped. He had actually wanted some a more religious toleration built into it. But it can be seen as a somewhat Lockean document. And from after 1689, Locke entered his most productive period of his career. The Two Treatises of Government was published in 1689. This is the 1690 edition, but it was first published in 1689, right after Glorious Revolution. Locke probably authored this, this book in the early 1680s, maybe like 1681, 1682, 1683. Maybe he probably tinkered with it while he was in Holland in exile, but it was published in 1689. And then his essay concerning human understanding Thoughts concerning education, his works on money and interest, letter on toleration, on Christianity, so on. So, whew, I hope that gives some good historical context. For part three, we're going to dive right in to that. And we'll, we'll, we're going to focus on the second treatise, the second treatise of government. And we'll look at the what Locke has to say about the state of nature and how we get from a state of nature to civil government. It will be good. See you next time.